Good morning, family of God. J.P. Greer here from the Sentinels for Christ on July 7, 2023, bringing you our Monday installment of SFC's 15 in the Word. We had some technical problems, and we are rerunning the video this morning, so I bless you in the name of Jesus. Um, I think that you're going to be blessed from uh, this study today. Um, first of all, we just want to thank all of you who walked with us through the study of the Gospel of John. Um, for really since the beginning of the year until last week, we're going to be loading all of those Bible studies from John up on our YouTube channel where you'll be able to get those, use them for your personal growth, personal study, personal blessing, and even use those possibly if uh, you may be teaching a Bible study amongst other people. We believe that if uh, you are seeking the Holy Spirit and God's expression, um, that the Lord's going to show up, doesn't matter what you use or, or how sophisticated you are in teaching the Word of God and, and that we can provide these type of tools for you and that you'll be blessed and thank you Stefan I got that uh, sign up and, and I, I just want to point out um, if any of you are in the possession of a microphone that looks like that uh, or thinking about purchasing that um, I, we would not recommend that you do that I did not deliberately show you that manufacturer and I didn't mention their name <laughs> but I tell you what, we have more than one of their microphones and they've been problems. Um, so we're going to be replacing those soon in Jesus' name. Um, but anyways, we are starting the book of Thessalonians uh, and chapter 5 today. And we started Thessalonians a year and a half ago. We got interrupted. We moved into the Gospels. So we're going to do a bridge message today on 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 okay because this is going to be the message that links up 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 with the second book of Thessalonians now 1st Thessalonians and 2nd Thessalonians have more to say about eschatology or the times of the end than any other book in the Bible okay other than the book of Revelation itself um, there's some familiar terms that come out of first Thessalonians 5 today Paul uses the term the day of the Lord um, which we'll talk about and we'll explain uh, a little bit about what that means but what I want to do is I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about um, the importance of Bible study in a way where we separate the wheat from the chaff and we we really get ourselves into a position when we're teaching the Word of God where we are in an anointing that's reflected by the supernatural gift of teaching um, uh, from the Holy Spirit that is referred to in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. And that's going to bless some of you immediately as I say that because th there are a lot of people who teach from this book, okay, and they are not blessed by the Holy Spirit. So you want to make sure that if you are um, receiving teaching from a man or a woman of faith that they are spending number one a sufficient amount of time in the Word of God to be a teacher there's no shortcut to it okay um, and that what is coming out of their mouth is in alignment with the rest of the book and that there are no contradictions with what they're teaching and what is actually occurring in their life so I want to talk about how do we get credible teaching okay well, I, I spoke to one of those things. First of all, is time in the Word. Do you know that most of the authors in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, I'm sorry to tell you, some of you, that they were, the, they were some of the most learned men and women of their time. They're smart people, okay? The Apostle Paul was one of the most studied religious Jewish individuals of his time. That's why he wrote probably at least 13 books in the, in the New Testament. That's why God used him. There's no shortcut, okay, to quality preaching and teaching and anointing than spending time in that book, okay? So I, I, I want to bless you for a second and let, you, and let you know how I got to be where I'm at a position of being a teacher, all right? Uh, and usually about every couple months we speak to this subject when we're doing teaching so that there's just a reference point for our listeners that listen to Sentinels for Christ. And we're closing in on 50,000 people at this point. God, it's just, it's all the Lord. Um, it, but really, one of the reasons that I teach the way I do is because the two men who had more 
um, impact on my life than any other uh, person on the face of the earth. And trust me, there's been a lot of people who have been in the faith and they have blessed me. Um, but there's two men that stick out more than any others. Um, and, and in fact, no one comes close to them. Okay. And they were both men of the word. One was Pastor Don Sheely um, from a, a church called Church of the Highlands in San Bruno, California. He's gone home to be with the Lord. One is Brother David Hogan, um, who runs a, a ministry called Freedom Ministries, and it's based out of uh, northern Mexico um, in Texas. And, and both of these men were tremendous words of the Lord, uh, tremendous men, uh, men of the word. I mean, they spent immense amounts of time in the word of God. Um, and I consider them my spiritual uh, mentors to some extent. I ministered with both of them uh, to some extent. And I, I tell you what, one of them, it's his goal to get a hundred, a hundred uh, chapters of the Bible in every day. Uh, the, the other one just spent the whole day and he had the ability to do this because he had opened up his, his church and that was the only thing he did was minister as a pastor. He spent his whole day in the Word of God reading it, praying, um, studying from commentaries. And I, both of these men lit the fire of my faith more than anything else. Good morning, Abraham. I see you. And, and Pastor Ar Ar Arlen, we see you as well. God bless you. So get yourself underneath the ministry of someone who spends a lot of time in the Word of God. Now, you may not be able to find the type of men I just uh, explained, okay? Well, get someone um, who is your teacher who you can see that they spend enough time in to where they have an anointing. I'm going to speak to you all for a second about the issue of anointing. You know. You know in your spirit when someone is preaching from anointing or preaching from the flesh. When you don't, it means you're confused and it means that your, your life, as well as my life, um, it, it is being governed by issues of the flesh. Okay, So when we make the spirit, all right, that target that we take that arrow out of our faith, we notch it up and we put it in there and we release that arrow of our faith towards the spirit, we will recognize anointing, okay? So I just bless you. If you don't have someone like that, be one, okay? Those of you who are listening today, those of you who are, who are, who are tuning in later, be a man or a woman who preaches the Word of God, okay? Because that's what the world needs. It doesn't need intellectualism. It doesn't need information. There's plenty of people that will tell you about Jesus, but there's very few that are actually walking in anointing. So with that... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is really uh, a, a two-part study. And the first part today we're going to get, get to is where Paul is responding to questions that have obviously been asked by the church to him. The church at Thessalonica okay, was one of the, the first churches that he ministered to and set up okay, on the second missionary voyage. You can read about what occurred there in, in uh, chapters 16 of Acts, and he went from there, if you remember, down to Athens and then made it to the church in Corinth. But Thessalonica, okay, and Corinth, uh, those churches have, have uh, at least one thing in common, okay, and that's that they ask Paul questions about the Christian faith. And in chapter 5, it is clear that Paul is responding to a question that has been asked about the day of the Lord because he jumps right off and talks about that. So I want to talk a little bit about that term um, so that you're going to be blessed. Friends, when it comes to the day of the Lord, which is mentioned over 100 times in the, New, in the Old Testament, okay, it, it, it may be referred to as that day or the day of the Lord, but it is a common theme understood by the Jewish mind in the Old Testament as the end, okay? Um, we believe in the New Testament, and it is certainly supported in the Old Testament. That is, a, that is a specific period of time, which is narrowed down to probably seven uh, linear uh, human years on earth. So when we use the day of the Lord, it is referring not to a specific day, okay, but this seven-year period of time, which Paul is talking about here, that is clearly understood um, if, if you study the Bible with any type of significance. And when we study the Bible, um, it's not only important that we study a book like First Thessalonians, 
but we need to know about the author, in this case Paul, right? We need to know about the culture and the, and, the, and the people that he were writing to because that will help us to understand some of that particular book. But we also need to understand the author enough that when the same subjects are spoken about in other writings of that author, right? Because Paul wrote multiple books in the New Testament that we see consistency amongst the books. That's the second level of verification that helps us to understand the Word of God Finally, there's a third level. Are the spiritual truth principles, which are derived from the writings from a book of the Bible, consistent with other spiritual truth principles in the Bible? And the only way that you get that is by studying the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Now you can understand why I started this study out talking about there's no shortcut to studying the Word of God. At Sentinels for Christ, okay, I want to let you know that we make it a point to study the Word of God from book from cover to cover, and we pray continuously for God to give us revelation about that. And we have found to do that accurately, it requires such a significant amount of time to do that as a responsible teacher of the Word of God that sometimes there is not uh, a, a lot of time for, for other things to happen. But there are other things that happened in, in our ministry, and I want to tell you about... Uh, uh, those are at, at the end of our session today. So with that introduction into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which is going to start talking about this issue of eschatology or the end times, I, I want to bless you, it, 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 particularly those of you who are watching us today, so that you understand uh, what is going to drive your understanding of the end of times, okay, or this period known as the Day of the Lord, which is mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? The Apostle Paul, being a Jew, okay, would have understood the Day of the Lord as being at that period of time when God moves amongst the earth to bring the final judgment of the earth, the final judgment and, and remedying of the things on the earth which are out of alignment with the will of God, which will mean, okay, a rebirth of the earth itself in a new form, okay? That's what the day of the Lord is. That's what Paul is talking about here. And to understand that, two things are really going to drive your understanding of that, or your theology of that, or your perception of how that will take place more than anything else. The first one is the following, okay? It is how you understand God's covenant promises to the nation of Israel and his relationship to Israel. That will drive more than anything else your understanding of the day of the Lord, of the end of the earth, and your understanding of the book of Revelation. The second item will be the return of Jesus Christ and what you believe about the timing of that and what are the events that precede that and what are the events that follow it. Those two things, God's covenant promises to Israel and the return of Christ will drive your understanding or, or, or promote confusion for you more than anything else in the New Testament when it comes to what we're talking about at this time. So I tell you that so that as you go on and take this teaching in today and go and look at some of the other teachings in 1 Thessalonians that we uh, spoke on, particularly uh, the fourth chapter, and then get into 2 Thessalonians, it'll help you, okay? So I bless you when we do that. Um, so this is a bridge teaching today because after this and the subsequent teaching, which we'll have on Friday, we're going to get into 2 Thessalonians, which is going to talk more about the day of the Lord um, than what we're talking about today. So the church at Thessalonica has obviously been upset and there have been false teachers that have come in and they have said the day of the Lord has taken place. Okay, this is made clear in chapter 4. This is why Paul is responding the way he does in chapter 5. So, chapter 5, verse 1. Are you ready? God bless you in Jesus' name. Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. That's really important. Paul just said that. Why would he say that? You and I have that need because we read about the end times in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and certainly Revelation. Here's why they had no need, okay? 
For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Paul taught them. That's why they had no need personally, okay? And while the earth is saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon it suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with a child and they will not escape. But you, brethren, you're not in darkness that that day would overtake you as a surprise like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day, and we are not of the night nor of the darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hmm, Paul talked about that breastplate of faith and that helmet of salvation in another book in the New Testament, didn't he? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. Receive this, okay? It's really important. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Christ Jesus, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other just as you also are doing. That's a short 11 verses, but I want to speak to it. God, God speaking through Paul clearly indicates the following metaphorically, symbolically, or allegorically. Okay, Paul talks about being people of the light or people of the day. That is always referring to people who are in the kingdom of God and people who are not. You clear about that? There is no gray middle ground, okay? There's people who are saved and there are people who are not. The people in the middle are either on their way towards the revelation of the cross or away from the revelation of the cross. There is no such thing as static ignorance, okay? There is something that we, we know is a deception and a veil that is put over the eyes of the people of this world, which is brought upon by the enemy of our faith, Satan himself. Another thing that Paul talks about in this section is be sober, okay? Why would he use that term of sobriety? Well, he's using it again, metaphorically, as a method of explaining those who are confused and those who are not confused. Because people who are drunk, People who uh, drink too much alcohol, in the moment when they are underneath the effects of alcohol, they are confused. They are not clear. They don't understand anything. And Paul is simply saying that the people of the day are sober people. Why? Because the truth of the gospel is in them. The day of the Lord is what Paul is talking about here. Because false teachers had come in, and this is not the first time that this is talked about in the New Testament. There was something that was occurring regarding the day of the Lord and the return of Christ that was confusing even from the beginning of our Christian faith. If you have time, watch the video, which is about 22 to 23 minutes long, on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we talk about the rapture. It will give you clarity on the return of Christ and eschatology and the end of the world. In fact, we are going to put up a link on YouTube uh, to that Thessalonian Bible study and post it. Sometimes when we put that link up, it doesn't work well because there's some conflict with putting up YouTube uh, advertisement on uh, Facebook, but we'll, we'll get it up there. And if we need to create those videos on Facebook again, we'll create a little playlist here so you get everything you need. But Paul is talking about the day of the Lord, okay? Because this is a teaching, okay, in the New Testament that... It, it is the focal point of everything we believe in, the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke about this near the end of his ministry in the last week of his life, and it is covered in all four Gospels in different, way, different ways. It's covered the most extensively in Matthew chapter 24, but also in the 21st uh, and 22nd chapter of Luke. The day of the Lord, the return of Christ, and what would be the events that surround that is something that Jesus taught. He is coming back, okay? Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And that is something that our Christian faith rests on, okay? And, and it, it is the assurance of hope 
for things that are not seen. It's that promise out there that we hold on to that all the people who preceded our faith going all the way back to Adam in the garden, okay, that we are in alignment with these people regarding the promises of God. The day of the Lord is the return of Christ, okay? But I want to talk about that term for a second. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, says some very specific things about the day of the Lord that's going to bless you and I think help you uh, get clarity. Uh, uh, hey, Abraham, I, I see you there. God bless you, uh, my friend. Jesus says this is going to be a time like no other time on earth. It's going to be that bad. I want you to think of some of the worst times in the last 200 years on earth. Man, there's some bad times. Look at World War I and World War II and what was done. Do you know some 40 million people on planet Earth were killed in World War II? The, the, the battles that took place in World War I, it was just terrible what men and women did to each other on this planet Earth. And I tell you what, what's gearing up on planet Earth right now is what we see taking place on the European continent and the stirring of the nations. It's going to make World War I and World War II look like child's play, okay? When Jesus was speaking about the events that would take place prior to his return, the, the, the day of the Lord, okay, the end, um, he was speaking about a time that would be so severe that there would be nothing like it on the face of the earth. These events are described clearly in the book of Revelation, okay, in a way that we can receive them and understand what is going on. But in particular, I want you to understand a verse that we spoke of today in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. I'm going to say that again. To understand the end times and where we will be as Christians, you need to have a very clear understanding of 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9, what we just read says, We are not destined for wrath. The day of the Lord is a day of wrath. So if you think that Christians are going to go through all of the tribulation, you are at odds with the Word of God, according to my reading of the Word of God, and you are also at odds with the words of Jesus, okay, who said that his people would not be subjected to that in that extent. God's people are not to be going through the time of the tribulation the day of the wrath, the day of the Lord, because God loves his people. And this people, uh, this time on earth is not going to be like World War I or World War II. It's not going to be like the great persecutions which, which took place against Israel. Those things are going to be made uh, to look like child's play in comparison with what is coming on the earth. So if you believe that God wants his people to go through that, and when I talk about God's people, I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about established followers of Jesus Christ right now, okay, who are serving him, who know him, and who are disciples. The Bible teaches in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, those people are going to be removed in an event which is called the rapture, okay? They're going to be removed from the earth. However, that does not mean that people will not get saved during the final seven years on earth. It is very clear from a reading of the book of Revelation that people are going to get saved and that one of the primary ministries of that salvation is going to be the nation of Israel and 144,000 missionaries that God sends out upon the face of the earth to let the people of the earth know about the God that they have not understood and that he offers them reconciliation in the Jesus who is soon to come. There will be people getting saved in the end of time, in the final seven years, that is very clear from the book of Revelation. But we want to let you know that what Paul is talking about here, the day of the Lord, he has clearly taught to the Thessalonian church that the church as we know it, that is serving him, is going to be removed from the earth. This is also substantiated in the book of Revelation when God starts talking about the, the ministry to the church at Philadelphia. Now, I wish, beloved, we had more time to talk about this. We simply do not. But as a method of bridging where we're going with 1 Thessalonians from here on out through 2 Thessalonians, 
it's important that you understand certainly what Sentinels for Christ teaches about the Word of God on that, but also what are the hallmark issues that you need to have understanding about if you're going to understand or, be, or, or not understand to be confused when it comes about the book of Revelation. Now, saying that, I in no way am telling you that I have a complete understanding of the book of Revelation. There are things in there that I scratch my head on for sure and go, wow, what does that mean? But I have found that if you understand the book of Revelation in the context of the whole Word of God, do you remember we started out this teaching on this, okay? Which requires an understanding of the book of Bible, what Jesus had to say in the four Gospels about his return, the prophetic, certainly the prophetic writings in the book of Daniel, in the book of Isaiah about the day of the Lord, and the book of Ezekiel about the day of the Lord, and Zechariah about the day of the Lord. You have to have an understanding from those books about what the Bible says about the day of the Lord, or you will be confused. Now ask yourself this question, how many people do you know have an understanding of those books, or have spent a significant amount of time in those books to be able to link that all up together to give you a presentation about the day of the Lord and the end times? And I would tell you, not many, okay? Not many. I've been a Christian some 40 years, and I've met very few people that have a sufficient understanding about those things to present them in a way which is helpful. I want to let you know that at Sentinels for Christ, we spend a sufficient enough amount of time in the Word of God. In fact, it's the primary ministry of what we do, beloved, that when we give you the Word of God, it is well studied, it is well rounded. I've told you who my human teachers are. There are also other teachers that they've gone home to be with the Lord who are men uh, uh, of the Word of God that I use when I study and bring to you uh, the Word of God. So I don't just make this stuff up alone. And I myself spend a significant amount of time on a daily basis in the Word. I saturate myself in the Word. Um, every chance that I possibly can to spend in the Word, I have it going on in my mind. And I find that by doing that, that what God does is He takes this clouded, muddled up head, the mind and brain of J.P. Greer, and He clears it up. Because this brain has a tendency to fall back into the old way of thinking, to forget what I've read from God's Word on a regular basis, and I need the Holy Spirit to be continuously bombarding me with God's spiritual truth principles from the Word of God so that what I bring you is clean. Okay, And in the context of doing that, um, if we are going to teach the Word of God, not only do we need to spend a significant amount of time in it, but we also have to spend a significant amount of time before the Lord ourselves in a way where we are blessed so that we can bring a, a, a Word of God that is credible, that is concise, and that blesses the Church of God. Because it is in the New Testament that says teachers will be judged more severely. So you can bet I want to make sure and do that. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the day of the Lord. The Apostle Paul is telling them that it has not occurred and that we are not destined for the wrath which is to occur in that day because that day is defined specifically by the word wrath. So it's sentinels for Christ. Brothers and sisters, we do not believe that you are going to go through that. But I'll tell you what. Even if God chooses for his people to go through the day of the Lord, and to remain on this earth, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be anchored in Christ so that whatever comes my way, I will continue to be salt. I will continue to be light as I rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to bring me through anything that meets me in the name of Jesus. Because did not the Apostle Paul himself say, it is in his weakness that he finds power. I bless you this week when we get together on this Friday. We will finish off the fifth chapter of the book of Thessalonians where Paul talks about just some practical things that will bless the church. And then next week we will start on the second book of Thessalonians. So until then, may God richly bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace, beloved, in Jesus' name. Until then.